uh, some flexibility about how uh, we'll leave the last few minutes of this discussion and go live to Capitol Hill now as the U.S. Senate is about to gavel in. Lawmakers today will take up consideration of a $1.1 trillion omnibus spending bill that funds the federal government through the end of the fiscal year on September 30th. The House passed the measure with bipartisan support yesterday, 359 to 67. And now to live coverage of the U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, our shield, as we approach the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, we thank you for raising up leaders who appeal to the better angels within us. Use our lawmakers to lead the quest for justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. As they lead our nation, guide them around the obstacles that hinder their progress, uniting them for the common good of this great land. Lord, enable them to go from strength to strength as they fulfill your purposes for their lives in this generation. May they stand for right and leave the consequences to you. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., January 16, 2014. To the Senate. Under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Brian Schatz, a senator from the state of Hawaii, to perform the duties of the chair. Signed, Patrick J. Leahy, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. Majority Leader. I move to proceed to calendar number 294, the flood insurance legislation. The clerk will report the motion. Motion to proceed to calendar number 294, S. 1926, a bill to delay the implementation of certain provisions of the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012 and to reform the National Association of Registered Agents and Brokers and for other purposes. Mr. President. Majority Leader. On this issue alone, we have been trying for months to move this forward. On our side, we have heard constantly, persistently, always, Senator Landrieu, indicating how important this is to her state and to our country. So I would hope that we can finally have a pathway forward on this today with a consent agreement. It's my understanding Senator Isaacson of Georgia is going to try to come to the floor soon and try to do that. I just want to alert everyone to this. If, the, if that isn't going to work, we're not going to be uh, delay this anymore. We'll file closure on this and move on it when we get back next work period. Following my remarks, Mr. President, those of the Republican leader of the Senate will resume consideration of the House message to accompany H.R. 3547, which is the legislative vehicle for the omnibus appropriation bill. Filing deadline for first degree amendments to the House message is 1 p.m. today. Under the rule, closure vote on the motion to concur in the House message to accompany the omnibus will be an hour after we come in tomorrow morning. There have been requests by both Democrats and Republicans to move the vote forward, and if that's possible, I'd be happy to cooperate with all senators if they would. If the majority of the senators would like to do this um, earlier, we'll be happy to see if we can get a consent agreement to do that. 
We're also working, as I've indicated, on the flood, and we'll continue to work on that. S 1931 is due for a second reading, I'm told, Mr. President. The clerk will read the title of the bill for the second time. S 1931, a bill to provide for the extension of certain unemployment benefits and for other purposes. I would object to any further proceedings with respect to this legislation. The objection is heard. The bill will be placed on the calendar. Mr. President, on this side of the aisle, we have not put to one side and forgotten about unemployment compensation extension for 1.5 million desperate Americans. Now, Mr. President, I want to just spend a minute or two on this issue, but we're, we have not forgotten this. And I want to direct everyone's attention to uh, editorial in one of the, America's leading newspapers today. Here's what they said. Republican senators are pulling out every fake excuse they can to think of for a filibustering extension of jobless benefits for the long-term unemployed. The majority leader, Harry Reid, was mean to us and wouldn't let us offer amendments, they say. And we've heard that a lot. I'm a really a mean person. Um, Democrats refuse to pay for the benefits. It's President Obama's fault because people can't find work because he won't approve Keystone XL pipeline. The truth is, the editorial goes on, the truth is the Republican Party simply does not believe that job seekers who have been out of work for six months or longer deserve government assistance. They most hard-hearted believe cutting benefits will give people an incentive to get back to work. The most cynical are hoping for widespread misery, which they can pin on Obama's economy for political gain in the elections this fall. Whatever the reasons, Nearly 5 million unemployed people will go, down, go without benefits by the end of 2014 unless the Republicans back down. The most appalling demand for Republicans was the benefits be paid for with cuts to other programs. And that's certainly the truth. For example, Kelly Ayotte of New Hampshire proposed requiring that parents have a Social Security number to receive a child tax credit, a move that would eliminate an important anti-poverty measure for millions of children millions of American children who are citizens, though their parents are not. We'll have more to say about this, Mr. President. We are not going to leave this issue. This is a cutting edge issue for the American people. Republicans outside Congress believe this is the right thing to do, majority of Republicans. Okay, on another subject, Mr. President. The Senate today will consider the House pass omnibus spending bill, an important bipartisan agreement that keeps our country on a responsible path while preventing another manufactured crisis. We've had so many of these. Mr. President, I cannot say enough about the work of the senior senator from Maryland, Senator Mikulski. We came to the Senate together. She is someone who identifies with the people of Maryland, like no one has ever identified with the people of Maryland. But in the process, she also identifies with people around America. That's why she's revered in Maryland. And she's been to Nevada. We love her in Nevada also. I don't know if anyone else could have done, could have done what she did, working with the Republicans in the House. I admire her so very, very much. And I'm very happy we're to the point we are here today. And this is after three years of damaging cuts to vital social programs. This bill finally increased investments in the middle class. Is it perfect? Of course not. I, there are so many good things to say about this bill. Um, she, who is in a state where the National Institutes of Health, where they are, where their headquarters are, she got an extra billion dollars for them, more than they got last year. It's too bad that the Republican cost-cutting had whacked them a million, billion and a half from the year before. But what she did with the NIH is uh, exemplary of what she's done to help America. And I saw it, I want to enough about her, but I, I, Ms. President, she has done something that no one else could do.
Mr. President. Republican leader. Yesterday I said there were a number of things the President could announce in his North Carolina speech that would draw bipartisan support and actually boost the economy. One of the things I'm particularly disappointed he didn't push, at least push harder, is trade. As I said, this is one of the brightest areas of his economic agenda. But if we as a nation don't act quickly and decisively, then the world is going to pass us, literally pass us right by. We're going to miss opportunities to benefit economically, to open foreign markets to American goods, and to America's political and cultural influence. And when you look at the rest of the developed world, from Europe to Canada, to Australia, they're practically falling all over themselves to negotiate more and better opportunities while we basically sat on our hands, a consequence of the President's inability to persuade his own party, his own party, to expand trade-related jobs. So we need to catch up, but we can't do that without leadership from the President, the kind of leadership like we've seen here in the Senate from the Chairman of the Finance Committee who is himself obviously a Democrat. He's been a tireless advocate for trade and for American agriculture. And yet with his retirement looming on the horizon, I'm afraid there might not be many Democrats left in the Senate willing to help lead on this issue. That's why we need the president to be deeply involved. We need him to step up for American workers and increase to exports by bringing his own party on board with the trade promotion bill that was introduced just last week. The authority in that legislation is key to enabling the administration to conclude critical trade negotiations that hold incredible promise for American jobs and economic growth. With our economy in such dire straits these days, opening new opportunities for American goods through trade should be a real no-brainer. It's an issue that used to be fairly bipartisan around here, and it can be again if the President's willing to lead. Millions of middle-class families and small businesses are counting on him to do just that. So I look forward to him promoting the benefits of trade and the legislation I mentioned in his State of the Union address. I hope we'll hear about that. And when he does so, Republicans will be right there with him to move the trade promotion bill through Congress in a bipartisan fashion. Now, Mr. President, on another matter, last week the Obama administration published a regulation that would effectively ban, ban coal-fired power plants from being built in the future. The head of the EPA, who will be testifying on this regulation today, basically admitted as much herself when she called it, quote, a significant economic lift, end quote. She knows that the technology this regulation requires is prohibitively expensive, that her own agency knows it's nowhere near, nowhere near ready for adoption, that even some White House officials do not believe her plan is feasible. And that's really the point. The point here is to eliminate coal jobs in America. That's why I wasn't surprised by emails that recently came to light emails which appear to show EPA officials colluding with extremist special interests in devising impossible to achieve regulations. The emails even referred to previously shuttered power plants as, quote, defeated, end quote, making the intent behind coal-related actions abundantly clear. And here's the other thing. This new regulation is not even expected to reduce emissions in a meaningful way not even expected to reduce emissions in a meaningful way. What it will do, however, is trigger a section of the law that would allow the administration to eventually shut down coal-fired plants that exist today. In other words, it would allow the administration to achieve its true aim of eliminating coal jobs completely, completely. For struggling middle-class families across eastern Kentucky, this is just the latest punch in the gut from Washington, from an administration whose own advisors seem to believe that a, quote, war on coal is exactly what's needed, end quote, 
from one of the president's advisors. Some call this regulation outrageous. Some say it's extremism at its worst. Here's what I call it. It's cruel, absolutely cruel. Because here's what's lost in this administration's crusade for ideological purity in its crusade for approval of coastal editorial boards. Human lives are what are affected here, the lives of people that I represent, folks who haven't done anything to deserve a war, a war being declared on them. These are the Kentuckians who just want to work, provide for their families, and deliver the type of low-cost energy that attracts more jobs to Kentucky. And coal is what allows so many of them to do all that. It provides well-paying jobs. And as uh, Jimmy Rose from Bell County, Kentucky, who's now become a rather famous country singer, puts it in his hit song, coal keeps the lights on. Coal keeps the lights on. I would remind my colleagues that coal does more than just keep the lights on in Kentucky. It keeps the lights on here, too, both figuratively and literally. From the anti-coal blogger tapping out a tweet to the EPA staffer cooking up a meal, millions and millions of Americans rely on coal to power their homes and their offices. In recent years, coal has accounted for about 40 percent of the energy electricity generated in our country. That compares to just 3.5 percent for, for sources like wind and solar. So even if the administration were to achieve its dream of eliminating every last coal job, it's not like they could just fire up a few windmills uh, to cover the gap. It's going to take a very, very long time, decades, for alternative sources to even come close, close to providing the same level of jobs and energy as coal. In other words, the administration's ideological crusade it doesn't even seem to have a logical end game. It's basically just ideology. And here's the thing. Republicans agree that alternative and renewable energy sources are, are necessary for fuel diversity. But we believe things like wind and geothermal and solar should be part of an all-of-the-above energy strategy that also includes coal and natural gas and the oil that we can get right here in North America with Americans providing the workforce. Another key difference is this. Republicans look at Kentucky coal miners and see hardworking men and women, not an obstacle to some left-wing fantasy. That's why I, along with 40 Republican co-sponsors, including my friend and fellow Kentuckian Rand Paul, intend to file a resolution of disapproval under the Congressional Review Act to ensure a vote to stop this devastating rule. We believe the EPA regulation in question clearly meets the definition for congressional review under this statute. <coughs> and I'm sending a letter to Comptroller General <coughs> Dodaro outlining the reasons why that is the case. And if the majority leader is serious about helping Kentuckians, he'd stop blocking the Senate from passing my Saving Coal Jobs Act, too. It's just common sense legislation that would give elected representatives of the people a greater say in how coal is regulated in this country. There's no reason for him to keep it bottled up a moment longer. Look, Kentucky is facing a real crisis here. The Obama administration appears to be sending signals that its latest regulation is actually just the beginning, just the beginning, and a new expanded front in its war on coal. Already, the administration's regulations have played a significant role in causing coal jobs in my state to plummet. These are good jobs that pay more than a billion dollars in annual wages to my constituents. <clears throat> and for every miner with a job, three more Kentuckians will hold a coal-dependent job as well. So the majority leader and his Democratic uh, caucus now have a choice. Are they going to stand with the coal families under attack in places like Kentucky and West Virginia and Colorado? Or are they going to continue to stand with the powerful left-wing special interests that want to see their jobs completely eliminated? That's the choice. It's pretty clear uh, where I stand and where most of my colleagues on this side of the aisle stand. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. 
Under the previous order, the Senate will resume consideration of the House message to accompany H.R. 3547, which the clerk will report. House message to accompany H.R. 3547, an act to extend government liability subject to appropriation for certain third-party claims arising from commercial space launches. Mr. President. Senator from Maryland. Mr. President, I come to the floor today as the chairperson of the Appropriations Committee, a committee I'm honored to chair to support the Consolidated Appropriations Act uh, for fiscal year 2014. This bill passed the House on Wednesday with a stunning and amazing vote of 359 to 67. The purpose of this agreement is to fund the operation of the federal government for the remainder of fiscal year 2014. The vote in the House, which I hope will be parallel here in the Senate, shows what working together based on civility, listening to each other, being willing to compromise but not capitulate on principle, but negotiating on what are the appropriate fiscal levels so we can get the job done. In today's era of shutdown, slowdown, slam down politics, where negotiating occurs on key cable TV rather than in committee rooms, we work together, setting aside partisan differences, working across the aisle and across the dome, we look to find how we could put together a bill that both sides of the aisle and both houses could agree upon. This is what the American people deserve. Us doing the business of the country, legislating in due diligence and a regular order. They wanted a government that works as hard as they do and working under a very stringent deadline, we were able to do this. After three years of damaging cuts that have hurt our people, hurt our efforts to help the people, this agreement turns the corner. We recognized that we needed to focus on growth and jobs and lower the unemployment rate, but not increase our debt or our deficit. We worked very hard to do that, to increase the kind of public investments that the American people would approve of, keep America strong, keep our economy strong, and to do the diligent work that we need to do. This bill is something called an omnibus bill. It includes all 12 appropriations bills. That means we have 12 subcommittees, Mr. President, financial defense, health and human services, labor and education, energy, water, financial services, and each one has to do their work to fund this. Ordinarily, we would bring one bill up at a time, but that was not to be. So where we are is that this is a consolidated bill of all 12. We've been working on this since the President sent his budget to us this spring. We held over 50 hearings, listened and did due diligence, marked up our bills. We were ready to come to the floor in the fall but it was not to be. We had to wait for the budget committee to do its work to give us a top line so we could get to our bottom line. On December 18th, just before Congress, just before Christmas, Congress gave us that cap on discretionary spending. We knew what we wanted to spend, but again, we know we've got to be a more frugal government. We know we've got to be smart not only about spending, but smart about saving, getting rid of dated, duplicative, and dysfunctional programs. And what we were able to do is do just that. On December 18th, we were given a cap on discretionary spending of a trillion O2. We met that cap. We worked nonstop over the holidays, resolving differences in both money and in certain policy areas. What we then do today is come here with an agreement that's bipartisan. 
I want to emphasize that the agreement is bipartisan. It's bicameral. That means both sides of the aisle. And it's also been one of compromise, but not on either side capitulating on principle. I'm proud to say that this agreement meets our national security needs. It ensures the readiness of our troops, keeps us safe at home, but it also meets the compelling human needs of our middle class and our most vulnerable. At the same time, it also invests in America's future by strengthening our physical infrastructure and also supporting research and development to save lives, spur growth and innovation in everything from life-saving biosciences to aeronautics. And we want to make sure we're looking not only at jobs today, but jobs tomorrow. Before I detail more about this agreement, I want to highlight one of the reasons I'm very proud of something we've done in this bill. Our legislation pending before the Senate restores the full cost of living adjustment for our working age disabled military retirees and survivors of our departed service members. Their COLAs were mistakenly reduced by 1% in the recent budget agreement. This agreement fixes that error. Now, I want them to make a note. It is limited in scope. It fixes the error for the disabled military retirees and departed service members. It is not the comprehensive pension reform that is necessary. We'll await for the presidential commission that will come before the Senate, and we will be able to implement and work on their recommendations in due time. I want to encourage my members that voting for this bill is to support the fix that helps our most vulnerable patriots. It is limited in scope, but an important down payment to restoring full COLAs for military retirees of working age who are either disabled or are part of the departed service members. Mr. President, this agreement provides for our national security. It has $11 billion more than current levels for operation and maintenance. One billion for the National Guard and Reserve so that our units are ready for missions overseas and are at home. The resources also support the Defense Department's three million active duty reserve and civilian employees. This bill, if it passes, eliminates the need for civilian furloughs in 2014. And also, it prioritizes readiness. The agreement also funds important areas in other protections of national security, an area that I'm very keenly interested in and is an increasing threat to our people and our economy is cybersecurity. One can only look at the headlines from Target to Neiman Marcus, 40 million Americans or more were hit by hackers that we expect came from a non-NATO member in a, a country based in a non um, NATO member country. There is a growing nexus between organized crime and those who have predatory, other predatory intents to the United States. We have $11 billion in here for cybersecurity for the Department of Defense, the FBI, Homeland Security, and important research agencies. This, air, this agreement also keeps its promises to veterans in terms of its health care, and we pay particular attention to the VA backlog disability. We believe that if you were in the front lines over there, you shouldn't face a long line here when you've applied for your disability benefits. And working with the relevant authorizing committee, we believe we've been able to come up with it. This bill also makes important investments in America's human infrastructure and meets compelling human needs in health care, education, and child care. We've increased our investment in Head Start by $1 billion, making sure 90,000 more kids across the nation are part of an early, early childhood education programs that improve their school and reading and math readiness. We've also increased the child care development grants by $154 million, meaning 22,000 more lower income families will be able to afford 
uh, child care, 24,000 in Maryland alone. We believe in our committee that welfare should not be a way of life, but should be a way to a better life. Child care development grants enable women to move from welfare to work. And also for those who are working at a minimum wage, where often full-time work means full-time poverty, that if you're going to work, child care should not eat up half of your already modest income. The child care development grant is a tool, along with the child care tax credit, to enable people to really be able to work and make sure work worth it. We also were very conscious on both sides of the aisle of federal, the federal need to support special education. We do not want a continued unfunded federal mandate where we require certain programs for special needs children but do not meet the federal responsibility for paying for it. And so we have money in there for this. So from energy assistance to help with food and housing, we've been able to do there. But Mr. President, we believe the best social program is a job. There's no doubt about it. To be able to work at a full-time job that supports your family and lets you get on the opportunity ladder for the American dream is what we hope to do. We believe, many of us, that jobs that by helping America's infrastructure, we meet two needs. We have an aging, decrepit, sometimes even dangerous infrastructure. The money in this bill will go through important programs like the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund uh, in terms of also Tiger Grants to help with transportation so that we can rebuild America's infrastructure and at the same time put America's to work on rebuilding our infrastructure. Also, at the same time, we believe that we need to look at the jobs tomorrow, where we fund the kind of basic research that only government can do, that leads to new ideas, that will lead to new thinking in the private sector, that will create the new jobs tomorrow. That means, for example, in the National Institutes of Health, we increase it $1 billion. It means they will be able to do 400 additional studies. It will also deal not only with our cures for things like cancer, but also the Brain Initiative will help also speed along the finding a cure or cognitive stretch out for Alzheimer's. This is good, good public investment. When we look at Medicaid funding, a, a cure for Alzheimer's or cognitive stretch out will not only save families the awful consequences of Alzheimer's, my father died of those, but it will also help our budget. When we look at Medicaid, 80% of the beneficiaries on Medicaid are children, but 80% of the money goes to long-term care for people who have either Alzheimer's or other neurological impairment diseases like Lou Gehrig, like Parkinson's, and so on. So when we can find a breakthrough on Alzheimer's, it'll also help lower the cost of Medicaid, and we'll be able to put it in other programs. Mr. President, there's many more things to be said about this bill, and I will say it later. I see my vice chairman is on the floor and he will want to speak and there are others who are also present that want. <clears throat> I will speak during the day, uh, but I want you to know I'm really proud of this bill. I think we did the job that was given us, we played the card hand that was dealt us, and what we've come up here is a good deal for the American people. We've tried to be smart about where we spent the money, and we tried to be really smart about how we tried to save money. So, Mr. President, I yield the floor and look forward to continued debate and passage of this bill. The Senator from Alabama. Mr. President, uh, I join my good friend and longtime colleague, the senior senator from Maryland and the chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, Senator Barbara Mikulski, who has just spoken here, in strongly supporting passage of the Consolidated Appropriations Act for fiscal year 2014. 
This bill, Mr. President, is the product of a bipartisan and very collegial negotiation between both parties in both houses of Congress. It is, in a very large part, a compromise of what the House and the Senate produced in their respective committee processes last summer. We, of course, have our differences, and each of us would have many things in this bill to be different. But that's the nature of a negotiation and ultimately of a compromise, and that's where we are today. There are many things that you would like and things you don't like in this bill. But on balance, I believe it represents a middle ground upon which I believe we can all comfortably stand. It's certainly far better than the alternative, which would be another confrontation, another government shutdown, and another giant step further away from establishing some sense of regular order. Mr. President, it's a matter of record that I did not support the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2013. It is and remains my strong preference that we continue to reduce our discretionary spending levels and more importantly, our long-term mandatory spending levels. As I've said many times, once the Congress has decided that our, what our spending levels are to be, I believe it's the responsibility of the respective appropriation committees to decide how those funds will be spent. The bill before us does exactly that. This legislation adheres to the statutory budget caps for defense and non-defense spending set by the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2013. It carries forward a spending level for a defense program that avoids a $20 billion sequester for 14. The bill funds total discretionary spending below the 2004 level when adjusted for inflation. Enacting this funding measure will allow Congress finally to advance its current priorities instead of relying on the spending priorities of the past, which of course is the unavoidable consequences of a continuing resolution. Seven out of 12 bills in this omnibus have been relying on appropriation priorities dictated for the fiscal year 2012. Instead of giving the executive branch virtually unfettered discretion, this bill includes hundreds of limits on how the executive branch can spend taxpayer dollars. It provides continuity for key government functions and avoids the uncertainty of additional continuing resolutions. Since the President took office, we've enacted 20, yes, 20 continuing resolutions. This bill today provides no new money to implement Obamacare by holding flat the funding for certain accounts at the Department of Health and Human Services and the Internal Revenue Service. It funds the financial regulators who implement Dodd-Frank at a level that is $424 million below the President's request. Mr. President, <clears throat> you will hear many times today that this bill is not the bill any individual senator would have written, and that's true. It includes concessions that many would not like to make, but it also contains funding or limits on funding for priorities that are important to members of both sides of the aisle. In my view, this is the prerequisite for a legislative compromise and is what we have achieved with this bill. I want again to thank the chair of this committee, Senator Mikulski, and commend her for setting a tone that made this agreement possible. I join with her in strongly urging our colleagues here today to support this measure, just as the members of the House did yesterday by a vote of 359 to 67. I yield the floor. A senator from Arizona. President, I ask unanimous consent to engage in colloquy with my colleagues, uh, Senator Graham, Senator Ayotte, and Senator Roberts. Without objection. Mr. President, uh, I bring to attention the, uh, my colleagues the front page of the Washington Post this morning. Hill balks at shifting CIA role in drone war. Congress has moved to block President Obama's plan to shift control of the U.S. drone campaign from the CIA to the Defense Department, inserting a secret provision in the massive government spending bill introduced this week that would preserve the spy agency's role in lethal counterterrorism. The measure included in a classified annex to the $1.1 trillion federal budget plan would restrict the use of any funding to transfer unmanned aircraft or the authority to carry out drone strikes from the CIA to the Pentagon. 
The Appropriations Committee is supposed to appropriate. The Appropriations Committee has no business making this decision. How many of my colleagues knew that this provision was in this mammoth appropriations bill? I'll bet you a handful. The job of the Armed Services Committee and the job of the Intelligence Committee is to authorize these things. There was no hearing on the Armed Services Committee. There was no hearing on the Intelligence Committee on this issue. Instead, a major policy decision that has to do with the ability to defend this nation against the forces of violent Islamic extremism is now being decided in a secret annex of a mammoth appropriations bill. It's not the first time, I say, that the appropriators have authorized. The appropriators have gotten into the business of the authorizing committees in a way that is a violation of every procedure and process that this Senate is supposed to be pursuing. I'm confident now that I, I believe that Senator Levin, the chairman of the, uh, of the Armed Services Committee, will be as outraged as I am. I believe that the chairperson of the Intelligence Committee will be as angry as I am. This is a fundamental function of government that has to do with national security, and it's hidden in a provision, in a secret provision, of the, of the mammoth appropriations bill. I say, I say to the distinguished chairperson and ranking member, that is not their business. Mr. President, some of us have been speaking out for more than a year about the terrorist attack of September 11, 2012, which took the lives of four American public servants in Benghazi, Libya, including U.S. Ambassador Chris Stevens. We've spoken out because of the many questions that still remain unanswered, and to this day, we, to this day we've spoken out and will continue to speak out despite efforts of partisans and proxies of the administration to sweep all of this under the rug. The latest snow job came in December from the New York Times, that ever-reliable surrogate of the Obama administration, which published a long report challenging some key facts about the Benghazi attack. But as Senator, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan used to say, everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts, and the facts are stubborn things. In reality, what the Times report does is propagate myths Let's review some of the facts. The Times claims the following, and I quote, months of investigation centered on extensive interviews with Libyans in Benghazi who had direct knowledge of the attack there and its context turned up no evidence that Al-Qaeda or other international terrorist groups had any role in the assault. The Times goes on to claim, quote, Benghazi was not infiltrated by Al-Qaeda. Here are the facts. Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups were present in Benghazi, and they were involved in the attack of September 11, 2012. The New York Times itself reported on October 29, 2012, and I quote, American officials said the attack included participants from Ansar al-Sharia, Al-Qaeda, and the Islamic Maghreb, and the Mohammed Jamal Network, a militant group in Egypt. All of these groups are affiliated with Al-Qaeda. The New York Times claims, quote, Republican arguments appear to conflate pure, purely local extremist organizations like Ansar al-Sharia with al-Qaeda's international terrorist network. Again, here are the facts. In an interview yesterday with CNN, the distinguished chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, a senator from California, acknowledged correctly that Ansar al-Sharia, which played a major role in the attack, is linked to al-Qaeda. The chairman was drawing on the work of our Intelligence Committee, which yesterday re released its report on the Benghazi attack and its aftermath. In that report, you will find numerous references by the intelligence community before the attack that make clear the nature of the al-Qaeda threat in Benghazi. The claims that al-Qaeda had not infiltrated Benghazi rest on the same rhetorical sleight of hand that holds that while groups may align themselves with al-Qaeda, may seek and receive direction from al-Qaeda, may share similar terrorist goals as al-Qaeda, and may even call themselves part of al-Qaeda, but if they are not sitting along the Pakistan-Afghan border, or not part of so-called core al-Qaeda, 
or al-Qaeda senior leadership, then somehow they are not al-Qaeda. This is the same bizarre language and logic that may have led then Ambassador to the UN Susan Rice to claim just days after the attack that, quote, we've decimated al-Qaeda. This despite the fact that al-Qaeda affiliated groups are proliferating and gaining traction all across the Middle East and North Africa, including in Benghazi. The fact is, the attack against our diplomatic facility in Benghazi on September 11th was carried out in part by al-Qaeda-affiliated terrorists who had established a safe haven in parts of eastern Libya. As the Senate Intelligence Committee report finds, the Intelligence Committee provided ample strategic warning about the negative security trends in Benghazi and the likelihood that they would further deteriorate. This was the opposite of an intelligence failure. This was clear as day. And despite these clear warning signs, the State Department was unprepared. Our diplomatic facility in Benghazi was insecure and had already been attacked multiple times. Our military is not postured and ready to respond to contingencies in a part of Libya where attacks against Westerners and Western interests had already occurred and where the threat of more attacks was growing. The false narrative that the New York Times is furthering just so happens to align with the Obama administration's account of events. But again, facts are stubborn things, and the Senate Intelligence Committee report clearly supports the conclusion that the administration knew or should have known of the terrorist threat in Benghazi during the relevant period and should have prepositioned assets or made other preparations to better protect our people serving there. The administration and its allies will continue trying to sweep Benghazi under the rug, including the fact that we have still not received testimony and the presence of the individuals who were present and removed and moved to Germany the day following the attack on the, on the embassy and the deaths of four Americans. Contrary to the President's repeated claim that the tide of war is receding, and contrary to his administration's talking point that al-Qaeda has been decimated, the reality is that al-Qaeda-affiliated groups are emboldened now from Central Asia to the Middle East and North Africa, all the way to West African countries like Nigeria and Mali. Indeed, nothing brings this home more tragically than watching the black flags of al-Qaeda hoisted over the Iraqi city of Fallujah. Ninety-five brave soldiers and Americans died in Fallujah. Six hundred were wounded. And today, and today, we see the black flags of al-Qaeda hoisted over the city of Fallujah. The problem's getting worse, and that is in large part due to this administration's disengagement from these regions. Look at Libya today a country that we and our NATO allies intervened to save from the wrath of an anti-American tyrant is now characterized by chaos and lawlessness and ungoverned spaces that are exploited by those who seek to do harm to our nation and our interests. According to the Senate Intelligence Committee's report, 15 Libyans who cooperated with our investigation into the Benghazi attack have been murdered. The administration can blame the Libyans for these problems just as they claim the Iraqis for Iraq's problems, but they can't escape their share of the blame for failing to support these people who want and need our help to secure their countries. That's why Chris Stevens was in Benghazi. That's why he risked and ultimately gave his life, because he believed that it is in our interest to lead events in the world, to support our friends and those who wish to be our friends in their effort to build stable, successful societies with effective democratic governments. The greatest way we can honor his sacrifice and those of his colleagues is by recommitting ourselves to their mission for unless America actively supports those in the broader Middle East who wish to replace despair and extremism with hope and freedom, I fear the tide of war will eventually hit us again. I note that my uh, colleague uh, Senator from New Hampshire, uh, I would just ask her and perhaps my, uh, my colleague uh, from South Carolina, is it not true that in this intelligence uh, report, committee report, which is 
uh, very encompassing, that except for one mention in the minority views, there is no one, no individual who is held responsible. So now we have a situation where bureaucracies are responsible, but individuals are not. I find that intriguing. Also, my, my friend from, from South Carolina, who has been trying to get witnesses for a number of uh, months, if not years, uh, as to who were, abs who were there at the scene of the attack, removed to Germany the following day, and isn't true we have never been able to interview uh, those witnesses, which could have cleared up any, uh, any arguments or any doubt about what the attack was all about. Uh, well, thank you for the question. I finally got to inter interview my first uh, survivor uh, about a month or so ago with Senator Menendez and Corker, but one after all these years and months. But if I could, I want to thank the Intelligence Committee for doing a lot of hard work. But let's don't lose sight that this is just not about the State Department. My focus is going to be comprehensive. And Senator McCain has called for a joint select committee, well, along with myself and Senator Ayotte, for over a year now. Why? You don't want to stovepipe this thing. The Intelligence Committee tells us in pretty good detail about the failures of the State Department. But here's my question. In the 14th September White House meeting, where the Intelligence Committee prepared talking points for the White House that clearly established this was a terrorist attack with Al-Qaeda people involved, who changed those talking points in that White House meeting? And I've got an email, I hope will come here in a moment, from General Petraeus. Basically, somebody in that meeting or before the meeting is inquiring of General Petraeus the White House wants to take references to Al-Qaeda out and basically sanitize the talking points, and he's upset, but he says, well, go ahead and do what they want. Nobody admires General Petraeus more than I do, but quite frankly, somebody needs to revisit that. And where was the intelligence community for two weeks when the President of the United States, not Susan Rice, was telling the entire world we think this was a protest caused by video when the intelligence community knew differently. So to my friends in the intelligence community, you need to answer that question. What input did you give? Did anybody pick up the phone and call somebody at the White House? You need to tell the president, quit doing that because it's not accurate. And another question. On the 15th, the 16th, and the 17th of September, all the survivors would, were interviewed by the FBI in Germany. I've talked to one. I can tell you in a quick summary, the man was brave. The people on the ground in the State Department deserve medals for going through what they did. But let me tell you this. He said there was no protest. There's not one report coming from Benghazi about a protest around the embassy. The Turkish ambassador left not too long before the attack. Do you think he had walked out in the middle of a protest? Do you think the ambassador would have went to bed if there had been a protest? The people in charge of security never reported a protest because there was not one. And he said there wasn't one. He said, I saw on my screen, and he's in charge of security at the time, 16 to 20 heavily armed people running through the gate carrying a banner in Arabic. At the time, I didn't know what it said. But let me tell you what the banner was. It was the banner of Ansar al-Sharia, the al-Qaeda affiliate. And to my friends at New York Times, journalism has died at this paper. Do you really believe this wasn't a pre-planned terrorist attack with al-Qaeda affiliates in charge? The gentleman said there were four gun trucks around the compound. It was a coordinated military attack, and they were lucky to have survived. Who started this? Who planned this? Uh, the man's name is Cuomo, is that his name? The former Gitmo detainee? I can't say his last name, but I think it's Kumi. Yeah. The man who started Ansar al-Sharia came from Gitmo, a former Gitmo detainee, a Libyan, who went back to Libya, started this group. The 60 Minutes report identified him and a Mr. Katala as the organizers of this attack. All I can tell you is that there is no mystery about who planned this. It was an Al-Qaeda affiliate in Libya 
And 16 August, a cable is sent back from Chris Stevens to Washington at the State Department saying we can't defend the consulate because Al-Qaeda, 10 training camps of Al-Qaeda exist in uh, Benghazi. The Al-Qaeda flag is flying. And oh, by the way, the Red Cross had left Benghazi. The British had left Benghazi because of attacks by terrorist groups. This was long before September the 11th. So don't tell me we don't know. We do know. It was terrorist. It was a former Gitmo detainee who was bin Laden's bodyguard. What do you have to do, have a card? The guy that was in Gitmo that we let go was core al-Qaeda. He was bin Laden's bodyguard. They caught him in Pakistan. Fought in Afghanistan. Now, what we don't know in this report, who in the White House Change the talking points. You want to know what Chris Christie did? Fine. Absolutely fair game. We know what he did when he found out what his people did about the traffic jam. He fired them. And he got up in front of the whole world and said, I'm embarrassed. It's my fault. I'm going to fire the people who did this bad thing. Name one person that has been held accountable for this bad thing called Benghazi. Name one person at the State Department who's been fired for ignoring repeated requests for additional security on the consulate coming from people in Libya. And oh, by the way, the Accountability Review Board, what did I learn in my interview with the survivor? I found out for the first time that Villa B and C, the places were attacked in Benghazi, the State Department consulate, the lease had been renewed in July for an entire year. I didn't know that for hundreds of thousands of dollars, well over a half a million dollars. So you're going to tell me that they were going to close the consulate in December? That was the conclusion of the Accountability Review Board? That's not accurate. i tell you what I think they were going to do. I think Hillary Clinton was going to go down in December and announce the permanent facility would be opened in Benghazi, and to her credit, and Susan Rice's credit, these are the two women that pushed the president to keep Benghazi from being overrun during the war with Gaddafi. They got involved, and to their credit, they pushed the president to get involved militarily to prevent the slaughter of everybody in Benghazi. And I've been told that the plan for Benghazi was to have a permanent footprint and for Secretary Clinton to go down there is one of her last acts to say, we're here and we're here to stay. The problem with that scenario is that the security had deteriorated because we had absolutely no plan to follow on after the fall of Gaddafi. So I would just quickly wrap up. Could I j just ask one other question? I think a lot of people who are observers really have to view this and these actions on the part of the administration a statement by now National Security Advisor Susan Rice on every talk show, Sunday talk show, that this was a result of a hateful video, a spontaneous demonstration. Al-Qaeda has been decimated. That you can only view that and some of these actions in the context of the fact that it was a political campaign, a presidential campaign going on where the rhetoric, time after time, at rally after rally, the President of the United States and his surrogates said, Bin Laden's dead, Al-Qaeda's on the run, the tide of war is receding. All of these events that took place at the consulate in Benghazi in the death of Christopher Stevens contradicted that storyline. And still, it, you cannot understand why two weeks later, before the United Nations, the President of the United States was still talking about spontaneous demonstration and hateful video. It, you can only understand that, in my view, that it is in the, was in the context of a storyline that was propagated throughout the 2012 presidential campaign. And, and I think the White House, in my view, this is a reasonable conclusion but not a fair conclusion because we don't know exactly what happened yet. But I can tell you this, somebody at the White House on 14 September pressured the intelligence community to change the story of Benghazi. And on the 15th of September, why did they pick Susan Rice? She says Secretary Clinton was tired 
and went through a lot of trauma. I'm sure that's true. But I know Secretary Clinton pretty well. I think she's tough. Let's put it this way. She couldn't be on TV to talk about what happened in the State Department because she was distraught. I don't buy that. Does anybody believe that about Secretary Clinton? And if it's true, it's something the American people need to consider. I don't believe it's true. I don't believe she was incapable of going on television, as Susan Rice says. I believe they picked the person very loyal to the president who would say whatever that needed to be said. And what she said was so far away from the truth, it needs to be investigated. And what she said was so beneficial to the president's reelection, it needs to be investigated. She was speaking definitively about Benghazi on 15 September while the FBI was interviewing survivors on the 15th, the 16th, and the 17th. Why would any administration go on national television and tell the world what happened in Benghazi while the FBI is still interviewing people who were in the attack? And where did the FBI's interviews go? I talked to the deputy uh, uh, director of the FBI, who is now retired. He said not one person interviewed by the FBI in Germany ever said there was a protest. All of them said it was a terrorist attack. So how could the FBI have interviews from every person on the ground in Benghazi who worked for the State Department saying there was no protest, it was a terrorist attack, and that not get into the system? Did the FBI just sit on those interviews? Who did they give those interviews to? And how could Susan Rice tell the American people in the world, we know what happened in Benghazi before the interviews were over? She went on television to spin this story. How could the President of the United States, after the interviews were taken, go before the American people time and time again for weeks and tell a story about a protest that never occurred? Ladies and gentlemen, this may not be a big deal to you, but it's a hell of a big deal to me. And when Abu Ghraib blew up, Senator McCain and myself said, this is not a few rotten apples, this is system failure. And when the surge, before the surge, when Iraq was falling apart, we said, this is not working, no matter what people in the Bush administration are telling you. We know better, we've been there. And when Gitmo was a mess, we didn't sweep it under the rug. We worked with Senator Levin and Senator Feinstein, two great Americans, to get the definitive truth as we could, the best we could, about failures at Abu Ghraib, about Gitmo, and we spoke truth to power when it came to Iraq. And the, now, fa the failures in are. Iraq, and we, called for, and we called for the resignation of the Secretary of Defense because of the failures in yes, Iraq. Yes, you did. Now, here we are, years later, the families have no clue as to what happened to their loved ones, and 